All right. Hello, everyone. Um, as in previous uh, presentations, the uh, chat button up in the top right where your name is, you guys can uh, use that to talk amongst yourselves. And uh, if you want to ask questions, you can use the uh, Q&A tab. Um, my foils have a, a lot of bullet points, and so I have them coming in one at a time to make it so that it's a little bit less cluttered. Um, so I won't be looking at the Q&A. We'll hold that to the end. And uh, I think I'll be able to get done in about 15 minutes, 10 minutes early. So I'm going to go ahead and share. And start the slideshow. Okay, hopefully this is working okay. Uh, so I'm going to talk about design of large, lightweight, high-power rockets. So here's some examples. Um, these are all scale, semi-scale models. Um, these range from 7 to 10-inch diameters and 6 to 8 feet tall. Um, and these are all examples that have flown many times. The uh, one on the far right is my... Uh, Titan II dinosaur that has a radio control ejectable dinosaur glider on the top that can also do an air start once it releases, and that's an 8-inch, uh, about a 6-foot tall booster. That entire stack weighs uh, about 80 ounces, ready to fly with the motor in it. So uh, here's a quick agenda. I'll talk about my background a little bit, so if you don't know me. Um, why design in this way or consider designing lighter? Uh, materials to consider, uh, advantages and disadvantages of using foam materials, uh, design considerations, choosing subjects, uh, simulations and trade-offs when you're doing the design, just a quick foil on uh, material testing that I did, constructing, finishing, and then I'll show some examples that are comparing standard high-power construction with cardboard and plywood and the way I've done them is a built-up model with foam and uh, some flight uh, videos at the very end. Okay, a little bit of my background. I've been building and flying rockets for 45 years and flying RC airplanes for 35. Uh, about 15 years ago, I started using Depron, which is a uh, uh, it's an expanded uh, polystyrene foam that comes in sheets, and it's got very good properties for model aircraft design. Uh, it's used, it's uh, manufactured now in Germany, and it's used for uh, wall and uh, floor insulation. Uh, back in 2015, I gave a presentation on using this foam for making uh, unique radio control rocket glider designs, and I started Dinosaur Rocketry to provide kits for people because there wasn't really at that time a market that was being filled by any manufacturer. There had been previous designs, but uh, those were um, you know, on eBay and quite expensive. Um, to go along with that, I've also built and flown more than a dozen 6 to 10 inch diameter semi-scale high power rockets using Depron foam as the primary construction material. And the reason I started this is I had built the dinosaur glider, and I had flown that as a standalone rocket glider, and I thought, hey, this would be really neat to put on a Titan II stack and do the suborbital test. However, that glider was an 8-ounce, 30-inch long glider, so it was very built, big and very lightly constructed, and I did a lot of simulations, and there was really no way to build a model using standard high-power construction materials that would be light enough to use a motor with a thrust profile that would not exceed 88 feet per second on boost, which is about the maximum that I thought that glider could withstand. So I knew the glider would fly successfully, but I couldn't push it very fast. You start getting heavier, and you have to use rocket motors with faster burns and um, higher thrust to be able to have successful um, rail exit velocity and be able to be stable and given the constraints that I had the only way to get it to work was to build a very lightweight 
booster to support that. And then once I did that, I said, hey, this is kind of neat. Um, I wonder if I could apply that to some other models. And that's kind of what I'm talking about. So why design lighter? Um, you can minimize size and cost of both motors and parachutes. As you get into nicer parachutes, those are not insignificant costs. It allows you to fly in smaller fields with larger rockets. Um, reduced risk of property damage in case of failure. These things are fairly lightly constructed and uh, they tend to crush when they uh, impact the ground. Um, and if you design them properly, you have the potential to fly under FAR 101 weights. Now, that wasn't my particular goal, um, but that is one, one potential for building large, lightweight uh, rockets. Um, and another advantage, reduced velocities and loading for specific float flight profiles. As I was talking about the Titan II dinosaur, that was a particular reasoning for me to get into this because I wanted to meet a particular velocity, which led to a particular motor and weight um, for the stack. So what do we typically use for high power construction? Cardboard. Uh, now, cardboard is great. It's not very expensive, sturdy, um, but it's typically heavy once you get over four inch diameter, like BT-101 tubing, it's very heavy. Um, for example, a 60 inch lock, seven and a half inch diameter tube weighs almost four pounds with the coupler if you were to you know, split it and have it separate. Um, that's almost the dry weight of most of these six to 10 inch pound or diameter rockets that I've built. Um, and again, paper and cardboard for skins, it adds up. You, you think that it's not, not very heavy, but I, as an example, in my X15 kit that I make, I'm using an inch and a half wide, um, 30 inch long piece of thin cardstock for the covers on the strakes. Just, just those covers themselves added a half an ounce. And when you're talking about a 12 to 13 ounce model, that's a lot just for a decorative piece of cardboard. So foam has a lot of advantages. Fiberglass. It can be light and thin, but typically heavy in the diameters and strengths that we use for high power and can be moderately expensive. Carbon fiber, again, extremely strong, but light, uh, but again, expensive, and there's not a large repository at this time right now really for um, large carbon fiber airframes. Um, plywood. Strong, works well, but again, heavy. So advantages and disadvantages of using foam materials. Um, advantages, lightweight, inexpensive, very easy to shape and work. And most of the construction can be done with cyanoacrylate, super glues, and contact, contact type cements. And it's very fast curing. So the, the gluing and assembly can go very, very fast. You're not waiting for epoxy to dry, uh, to cure. Disadvantages, uh, susceptible to hangar rash. So I've probably got more damage in these rockets getting them up and down the stairs in my house and in and out of the van than I have from flying them. But again, it's it's surface and cosmetic. If you, any of you guys have flown foam RC airplanes, you know what I mean. It, you know, there's it, it, it's foam and the surface is soft. So, um, you know, you just have to be a little careful in the in the handling and, and uh, you know, whacking it into stuff. Um, these, I would say, are not really suitable for ultra-harsh landing sites, things with brambles, sagebrush, uh, large boulders, those kind of things are hard on foam. And there are some limitations in paint types and brands of the paint because a lot of the uh, uh, solvents, aerosols uh, in paints will eat uh, particular types of foams, so you need to be a little bit careful, water-based paints. Um, some enamels um, are fine. You just need to be cautious in that. So looking at a couple of the materials that are available commonly for use in RC aircraft and also applying it toward this, uh, Depron, which is an expanded polystyrene. It's currently available from rcdepron.com. For about five years, it wasn't available in the U.S. as the importer stopped importing. The original manufacturer had changed their formulation 
because it's used for uh, insulation and not for radio control airplanes, they didn't care if it came out um, flat or not, because it's going to go in between a wall. Now they've since there's a new manufacturer. They've gone back to what they used to be doing, and it's back to very flat, very high quality uh, material. Um, and then there's three millimeter, which is very flexible and formable for skins, and six millimeter, which is stiffer and has a high quality flatness, and both sides have a nice uh, finish. Model plane foam, which was developed from some modelers that didn't know what to do when Depron wasn't available anymore. So they worked with Adams that makes ready board Dollar Tree foam and tried to manufacture something that was equivalent. Unfortunately, it really wasn't. It's, it has thickness variations, surface waviness, the finish on both sides were different. One had more texture or not, but it was extremely flexible. So if you were doing a built up model with formers and curving skins and many pieces and you're going to sand it and um, put a, uh, a filler on top of it, that was okay. If you're building simple models with flat non-airfoiled skins and you wanted to have a nice finish on it, um, that wasn't going to work for you. And then there's expanded uh, polypropylene, which is a flexible and dent resistant type of foam, but it's heavier and it has a coarse visible grain. So you can approach this problem using a number of different materials in a number of different ways, but these are the design targets I chose primarily because that Titan II, that was what I needed to go with, and I kind of kept the same design targets. That was a kind of a sweet spot for me, what I wanted to do. So I was targeting something in the five to six pound ready to fly weight using 29 millimeter H and I motors for flights from 700 to 1200 feet. So that's a nice altitude. It goes pretty high in a six foot rocket. You get to see the whole flight profile. You get to see the parachute come out and it's impressive looking. It's not, you think like, oh man, I wish that went higher. It's, it's a nice, it's a nice altitude. Uh, typical motors I've used H97, 115, 135, the 128, which is the reloadable version, H180, and the I200 and I205. So long, small diameter motors, again, put the center of mass of the motor further forward. Those are more advantageous for minimizing nose weight required. And really, for my purposes in these sizes, the I205 is really an ideal motor for these models. I wanted to do things in the 6 to 10 inch diameter. It's easy to form the skin around something at least 6 inches in diameter. A little smaller is a little more problematic. Um, and it's again, it's an impressive size, applies to several scale models in a reasonable, you know, kind of 5, 6 foot, 7 foot tall range. And um, I, that was kind of what I wanted to build. And again, 5 to 9 feet tall is, is typical. Um, with these designs, with a five to six pound weight, a five foot shoot and shoot bag um, gave me a reasonable descent rate that minimized uh, any landing damage. And I wanted to use altimeter deployment. So these are these run completely off of altimeter. I have no backup um, um, motor ejection, but um, the altimeters I particularly use a um, uh, Altus Metrum Easy Mini. Um, I've also used uh, Missile Works. And I've had flawless uh, um, uh, use of, of the altimeters. And I particularly didn't want to add additional fiberglass or carbon fiber reinforcing to reduce time, complexity, and weight. You could certainly do that on top, but then you start to get um, uh, reduced gain of building lightweight. Good subjects that I consider for this build method, models with small fins, like the Hellfire missile, the Redstone, and Jupiter C. So the advantage of building them the way I've done them is most of the weight is in the front part of the model. So models with small fins typically need more nose weight. Uh, Mid-mounted fins, like the Pershing 1A and the Falcon, again, you minimize the amount of nose weight that you need with this kind of construction. 
Um, and forward fins like the Titan II Dinosaur. Uh, again, your CG is going to typically need to be further forward on these models. Um, also, finless models that need clear fins for stability, I've been able to apply that very well to this method um, using lightweight polycarbonate. And because you're building a lighter model, a model that's maybe not flying quite as fast, you can get by with thinner, um, large polycarbonate fins, and you don't have flutter issues. Uh, in my 10-inch Atlas, I'm actually using 1 16-inch polycarbonate fins, and it's flown beautifully with that. So I'll talk a little bit about designs, simulations, and trade-offs. So these are things to think about when you're building. This is a model that you need to think about when you're designing it before you just start gluing things together. So design your model for the largest model you, motor you intend on flying. Um, uh, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about why. Plan your construction technique, the material you're going to use, the stringers, the skin, the fin, visualize it, where you're going to put your altimeter, where's the parachute going to go. Um, use a simulator. So I use, I use Open Rocket, but I'm primarily, because it's altimeter deployment, if I'm sure that my weight and my drag is reasonable and I'm using a motor that I am comfortable with, I'm not worried about exactly how high it's going because I don't care about that. Um, the altimeter is going to eject at apogee, so I'm not so much worried about that part of the performance, but I use it as a mass balancing tool. So I build it in open rocket with the stringers and the skin and the weights, and I'm where my parachute's going to be, exactly how much my parachute weighs, and the motors that I'm going to use, and I adjust the placement, the size. As I build it, I update. I said, well, how much did I add in glue weight? Um, in where um, and and look at that and in some cases I've adjusted things and you can see before you ever build it is this a flyable design am I within that target weight somewhat you know how how much nose weight am I going to add is that a reasonable thing that I can fit in where I where I want to and um, you can you can make some decisions and then also Use components that are scaled for the application and the weight. Don't just use whatever the hardware store has. It's very easy and high power to say, that looks about right, I'll just, I'll just double it. You can't do that in this. You, you really need to think model rockets and lightweight. And again, the old cat, you know, adage, build it to fly, not to crash. So here's an example of an open rocket file showing my Pershing 1A. So you can see I've got my fins in there with the fin material and the weights they are. You've got all of the centering rings, so you've got a plywood centering plate at the back end. I've got a motor retention cap on there. I've got all of the centering rings that I have in there about uh, eight inches apart. Um, I've modeled the skin as a tube, but I know how much that skin weighs. And you can see there's a 29 millimeter stuffer tube that goes right up the middle into this forward section here, which is a four inch PML phenolic tube. And that contains the ejection charge pressure. Um, the nose cone is just this small piece. That's a foam uh, cone that I, that I uh, um, built up myself. And this is a piece of um, lock or sorry, um, PML, uh, I think, well, blue tube coupler that fits into the parachute bay. So the idea is this parachute bay, the coupler or the, the, the uh, shoulder of the cone isn't stealing any area. So this is sized perfectly to fit um, a couple of Nomex blankets, the Kevlar line, and the chute and chute bag, and it's full. There's no extra empty space and that minimizes the amount of ejection charge also that you need. And over here with this little dotted area, that's where the altimeter is. So the altimeter sits here, there's a little hatch. I route into the stuffer tube with the squib wires. They go up the stuffer tube into the parachute bay and I have a little cap that I've made that I'll talk about that has a hole in it. And I route the squib wire through that, mount my ejection charge and then put that cap back onto the stuffer tube that plugs the stuffer tube so the stuffer tube isn't getting pressurized, nothing blows back into the altimeter section, and the um, ejection compartment is all self-contained. 
Material testing. So before I started this, I built a section, so an 8-inch section uh, lengthwise, and I built a half section. So four, in this case, these are full-length stringers of 6-millimeter Depron, two centering rings, a piece of 29-millimeter cardboard uh, lock or um, Aerotech stuffer tube. And then in this case, it was a 2-millimeter skin that I had at that time, but 3-millimeter would also work. I looked at the rating. It's rated at 21 PSI with 10% deformation. I took a test. I filled up as much uh, lead bullets as I had in a 50 caliber ammo can, which weighed 75 pounds, and rested it on just this structure with the skin, just that part of it, and there was no deformation. So it, it's, it's very stiff in the long axis. So tips to help. Reduce weight where possible. Drill holes and ply centering rings to lighten them. Drill holes in the polycarbonate fin roots to lighten them because typically the, the fin root isn't taking much force. Phenolic, or, um, polycarbonate's very flexible. Uh, use the lightest weight hardware store, you know, hard, hardware you can. Um, the lightest eye bolts that you think you can get away with. Avoid quick links. Use slip uh, slip loops. Um, unless you need the nose weight, don't put the weight in there. Okay, construction. So I'll go through a series of how I kind of did this, things to think about in each section. Um, use aircraft construction. So think a built-up model with an internal structure and skin, centering rings, stringers, um, and skin. Uh, use interlocking pieces. So tabs and slots. So each of that, you'll, I'll show some pictures at the end. I apologize, all my pictures are really at the end. The, the, each centering ring, depending on how many stringers you decided to put, will have slots that go part way. And the stringers also have slots that go part way. So they slide together and interlock. So you can assemble the majority of the airframe without even the stuffer tube in it. It'll self-align. You make sure it's straight. Uh, you put the stuffer tube in, and then you uh, start gluing the joints once you're happy with the fit. That You get some mechanical um, strength in addition to just glue strength. Um, plan and pre-build fin boxes. So again, you don't have a cardboard body tube that you can just cut a slot in and support the fin. You need something that's going to take the force of landing and flight and any flex you have. So you may need to build a fin box out of foam material that the fins are going to slide into once you've skinned it. Think about recovery and landing loads, descent rate and parachute size. How big a parachute will you need? How big of a parachute container section are you going to need? I, I can get by with about a 14-inch long piece of PML tubing, which has a couple of centering rings that connect it to the stuffer tube, so you're left with about 12 inches of room. Uh, you may need more or less, depending on how you're building. Uh, space your centering rings and longer runs close enough to give support to the skin. And make sure that the skin bonds to the stringers and centering rings. Otherwise, it's not doing you any good. It's just a cosmetic shell as opposed to giving you some of the, uh, the strength. And plan for sufficient fin stiffness to prevent flutter and landing damage. So you need to size the fins for the span um, and where they're located and uh, how fast you're going. So what I used is centering rings with about a 6 to 8 inch spacing. That seemed like a good trade-off uh, between minimizing uh, weight and how many uh, centering rings I needed. Uh, Longer ons, I've used full depth to the stuffer tube and half depth, and the models have functioned and survived equally well um, in both in both manners. Uh, again, the longer ons notch to the centering rings for strength and alignment, and the stuffer tube is slipped into place and glued after the major st structure is kind of assembled. Um, Think about extra longer on. So another longer on next to one that's previously there, that'll be where your skins, when they're wrapped around the structure, will meet. 
and that way you're not trying to align a 30 inch wide 40 inch long piece of sheet using contact cement that once it touches you can't remove it or you're tearing the foam so it's one shot needs to be right and you're going to wrap this around an eight inch diameter tube and you have to account for the thickness of the skin if that doesn't align perfectly on a six millimeter wide longer on you're kind of hosed so by putting another longer on next to the other one that gives you about a half inch uh, surface where you can have a little misalignment and still have plenty of glue area that it's going to attach adhesive so i'm using epoxy in very select places so it you know it's it's uh, heavy but strong can be high temperature and i use that for the um, motor retention uh, cap the ply centering rings to the stuffer tube and the parachute tube mounting and that's it otherwise there's no other epoxy on this uh, contact cements cements yuhu por that's a tube based contact cement or 3M77 a spray adhesive. Uh, if you guys have built the new Saturn Vs, that's what they use for the wraps. So this is good for laminating large areas of foam or applying skin. And CA glue. So I'm using a foam safe type, Bob Smith in particular, the brand, um, with an accelerator spray. So I'm using a, a, a um, gap filling. It's a little bit thicker um, type of that. It's quick setting. Um, and again, you have to have a foam safe, otherwise it'll eat your foam. Um, you can also use thin, normal stuff for soaking into your cardboard. If you were using a cardboard parachute bay instead of phenolic, um, it allows very fast construction. So the stuffer tube and the plywood plates, where have I used these? At some point you needed, I needed something that was a little bit stronger than the foam. So I've used 29 millimeter cardboard or PML tubing. Cardboard's a little lighter, of course, for the motor mount and to act as a spine for the model. So everything kind of glues to the uh, to the stuffer tube. I've used a plate at the bottom, and I use that to. I'll show you how I attach the uh, the fins, but that ply plate is used for uh, fin securing, uh, motor retention, and also uh, to attach the. Um, uh, rail buttons to uh, again because you don't have a cardboard or fiberglass skin you can't just put a t-nut on the underside of the foam and hope that your t-nut's going to hold you have to have blocks in wood mounted that you can screw into once you've got your skin on um, I have another ply plate which is up at the near the top of the model or where the nose cone taper would normally start if you've if you've got a nose cone um, and that's the other end that has the other rail button on it. And that also, um, then I also uh, secure, along with a couple of extra small centering rings, the uh, parachute bay. So it, and then the, the um, um, recovery attachment point is also tied to that. So all of your recovery load is basically hanging off of these plywood plates mounted onto the spine and the foam structure is around it. Um, you can use full ply plates, not pie plates, but ply plates, um, or partial plates at the top of the fins to support them. So I'm going to show how I make slots using hardwood blocks um, instead of a fin box. And the, you slide the polycarbonate or foam fins into these slots to basically align and attach your fins. Um, on the forward end, you need something too. You could either put another plywood plate, but that's fairly heavy. Uh, you can put, uh, what I did was pie-shaped sections in that fit in between stringers, glue those to a foam centering ring, have your, um, your hardwood guides in there, and that is enough to support, because you've got just a shearing moment, uh, in the joint between the plywood and the foam, and it's in between two stringers, and that's very strong, and that allows you to cut about half the weight of a full plywood plate at the top end. Uh, so fin design. Um, on a model that has smaller fins or finless, I prefer polycarbonate. It's Lexan and the hobby use. Um, 
I've used 1 16th inch again for my 10 inch Atlas uh, or 3 32nd uh, for my um, my Titan 2 and on the upper fins of my Pershing 1A. It's very flexible, um, but being flexible, you need to transfer the landing stress to the centering range because what can happen is if you land, if you don't have the skin supported where the fin goes through, that fin can move you know, an eighth of an inch or more if it's not supported well into the centering rings. If, if that fin can push it all, it's going to push that skin and buckle it. Um, so I use hardwood strips on the ply centering rings on each side of the fin root um, to take the stresses of landing, and, um, and that's worked quite well. Um, one other, again, like in the overlap of your skin, uh, when you're skinning the model, you do need to put a small foam stringer on each side of where the, the, the fin will go <clears throat> that you're gluing the skin to. You can't just leave the skin unsupported because it'll tend to pucker up a little bit. Um, you need something that's firm that you're going to contact cement the skin to, and then you're going to cut your slot out and access your fin box and mount your fins into. You can also use foam, laminated foam fin design. I've used this before in the uh, the Titan II. If you have a very large, wide root fin, uh, polycarbonate's too flexible and it's going to be too heavy in in large amounts. And so, um, in those cases, I've laminated six millimeter foam with carbon fiber rods and/or strips. So I may have a carbon fiber rod. That goes the span of the of the uh, fin that goes all the way to the root to give it stiffness uh, in bending, and I also have put angled strips or carbon rod going from the midpoint down to the bottom corner where you're likely to hit when you land, and that gives something to kind of take the landing punishment. Um, the, these are good for models with very large fin areas. I can you know I can have a one foot root by you know foot and a half fin. Um, that weighs ounces. Um, but you do have to expect that there will be some eventual, you know, crush or scarring of the, you know, if, if you've got a large piece of foam and it hits the ground, there's going to be a little bit. So, you know, you may have to touch it up a little bit, but, you know, it gives advantages that you may not get something to work using another method. Uh, rail button mounting. So again, there's no body tube. You can't just put a T-nut on the inside. So uh, you need to mount hardwood blocks to the plywood centering rings or one of these pie-shaped triangles of plywood material, let's say in the middle of the model, and you could glue that to a foam centering ring, but at least that gives you a good shear connection and you can mount the plywood uh, mount the rail button hardwood block to the ply plate and then you're going to mount the uh, the rail button to that but you need to keep track of where these are and what me you know how far up are these blocks so you can drill your holes and mount your rail buttons because you're going to do that after you've put the skin on uh, altimeter placement so I wanted to put the altimeter as far uh, up on the model as I could to help with CG the my altimeter is mounted in a little 38 millimeter pod and it's held in by Velcro and I use that same altimeter pod for all of my rockets high power foam or standard construction it's it's movable from rocket to rocket um, but you want it to be high enough so that you're kind of minimizing your squib distance into the parachute bay because consider on a Pershing 1A I'm not breaking the model in the middle just the small 10 inch section of nose cone that's four inch diameter that's the only thing that's ejecting. So my squib needs to get pretty far up into the model. So you want to minimize that. Um, you need to be able to get at the uh, altimeter while you're on the pad, obviously. And I've, I have an access door in each of the models. It's held in place with magnets. And the door has a vent hole. The altimeter pod has a vent hole. So it's vented to the outside, but it's not mounted up against the outside of the skin. And that's worked absolutely fine. And it's held in place with a Velcro strap. And I have uh, used JST connectors to connect from the squib. I, I pre-solder JST connectors to the uh, to the um, 
um, to the squib. And so I route it up into the parachute bay, and once it's all connected, I just plug it into the wire that's coming out of the altimeter pod that's all sealed up. Parachute compartment. So it needs to be just big enough to hold the parachute in the Nomex bag, no bigger. That minimizes the amount of, of area you need to pressurize. Um, it needs to be, you know, firm enough to withstand the ejection force and tough enough to prevent zippering if you had a late ejection. Now, one advantage of the altimeter is late ejections aren't really as much of an issue anymore. Um, I like PML tubing. It adds some weight up in the nose where you want it anyway. So if you're going to add dead weight, it might as well be doing you some use. Um, the the um, phenolic tubing is very nice for that. And it's also fairly immune to zippering in the flight loads and the weights of these model in a you know a five five pound model um, that is ejecting at the top. That's not going to take a lot of force. Um, and then I, as I alluded to before, I have a plywood cap, a little eighth inch cap that's about an inch in diameter, well, about an inch and a quarter in diameter, and a coupler. And once I've routed my squib through that and attached my ejection charge. I push that down into the, um, uh, the stuffer tube that blocks it off. My, my uh, parachute section is sealed up with the ejection charge in there. Nose weight. So again, these are foam. You want to minimize um, risk of a heavy nose cone um, slamming into it. So one thing is minimize the part of the model that ejects. So in all these models, that four inch parachute bay is mounted as far forward as I can to be in, you know, as far forward up into the nose section to where that four inch diameter is, that's, that's where the, um, the airframe ends. So it may look like it's a nose cone, but it's still part of the airframe. And then just the very tip is the part that actually comes out with the coupler. Um, the other thing, because this is a hollow structure, you can mount your nose weight because it's so far forward where you know your the nose is that's still part of the airframe. You can glue you know lead BBs into the structure around the parachute bay, which is very strong, and then skin over that. So it's not in the part that actually ejects, but it's doing you almost as much good as if it was in the very tip of a hollow nose cone. Skinning the model. So skin the model in large sections. So it's just, it's easier. It looks nicer if you can do large sections with that. But you do need to allow skin thickness when calculating the size of the sheet. So typically I'll, I'll actually cut them slightly oversized, spray them with the contact cement, apply them and roll them, and then do a final trim once it's abutting um, the other piece. Um, again, adding stringers, extra ones to support on either side of the fin and where your joint's going to be allows for a, a better looking skinning job and uh, model. And again, you're going to do the skinning before you're mounting the fins and rail buttons. So you're, you're assembling the substructure, you're putting in your stuffer tube, you're gluing all that, and then you're rolling the skin on, and then you need to cut your fin slots. So you need to have some marks on your, um, uh, on your uh, your plywood plate, where where the fin lines are, what their spacing is, and measure ahead of time. Here's where my fin slot is. Something like a rear mounted fin isn't so bad, but if you've got Pershing fins that are mounted halfway up the model, you need to know exactly where those fin slots are going to be because you're going to have to cut those out. And in a three thirty second inch wide fin that's going to go in there, uh, you know that's not a lot of margin. Uh, finishing. So the Depron material can be painted with a water-based paint or with testers, model master sprays. Um, I've also used uh, self-adhesive Oracal. It's a vinyl uh, self-adhesive film. That's what Sticker Shock 23 uses. I've used it to fully wrap in the case of the Titan II, partially wrap, um, and so I minimize the amount of paint I need. Once you apply that, you can heat it with a hot air hair dryer and press it down, and it really conforms to the, the the skin, and it adds strength and resistance to hanger rash. Back before Tower Hobbies got bought out, when they were still making monocoat 
you could get the self-adhesive monocoat, which is a, um, um, a mylar film, which is even tougher than the Oracal, um, but it's not as flexible to go around compound curves, where the Oracal, you can kind of push it and heat it, and it'll kind of form into complex areas a little bit better. Launch pad. So these can launch on any rail pad. However, the high-mounted altimeters, because I have them very high up, like, say, you know, five feet high, on a six foot rocket or you know four feet high if you have a pad that's two feet off the ground and you have a standoff you probably would need a stool or something to arm it so primarily for my titan dinosaur because that thing was nine feet tall and i had to put a glider up on the end of it once it was mounted and armed um, i built a simple flat launch pad using um, three inch black pvc plumbing pipe with a small blast plate uh, that keeps the model lower to the ground, and I can reach the altimeter without needing a ladder to get up there. The one thing, though, because I'm using rail buttons that are mounted on the bottom and the top ply plate, they're fairly far apart. So my rail button spacing is typically four to five feet apart. So if you consider a standoff, an eight-foot rail isn't giving you much guidance. So I usually use a 10 to 12-foot rail or uh, you know two six-foot rails that are um, uh, joined with a splice to give adequate guide time just so that the you know the, the the top rail doesn't come off within the first few feet and if there was a gust of wind um, you know it might cause it to uh, to go a little cattywampus here's a little breakdown of airframe cost for one of my models um, the foam cost was about forty dollars for this that's shipped for these sheets now these sheets are quite big these are uh, 54 by uh, 45 inch sheets uh, so they're quite big. I needed two sheets for a typical skin and two for centering rings and stringers. Uh, PML parachute tube and a coupler, 20 bucks. 29 millimeter tubing and a coupler to join two pieces, 12 bucks. Uh, Aeropack retainer, a uh, couple of sheets of birch aircraft ply to make a couple of centering rings, and um, eye bolt and uh, rail buttons and a little, you know, 20 bucks for polycarbonate. Now the polycarbonate's nice because if you design the polycarbonate simply, you can just score with an X-Acto knife, put it on the edge, and in the uh, 1 16th and 3 32nd thicknesses, you can actually flex and break it, and it'll make a nice clean break just like a piece of glass would. And you don't need to finish that edge, um, and you don't have a stress riser. Um, if you start making corners like internal corners in a fin tab need to be a little bit more careful cutting those uh, maybe with a reciprocating saw or a cutoff wheel um, and uh, make sure that you don't have a stress riser in a corner that's going to crack okay so i'll go through a few design studies of models that i've actually made uh, in both high power and this design uh, method and material and show you kind of the trade-offs and the weights and a typical motor that I would fly it on. Now, in the high power ones, yes, you can add more nose weight, can put a bigger motor in it, it can go much higher, but this is the kind of altitudes and I don't like to walk very far. And um, so this kind of shows an apples to apples comparison. So let's look at a full scale Hellfire missile. So it's really seven inch diameter. I built it in seven and a half with the high power materials in mind. 64 inches long, small fins, forward mounted fins, using lock seven and a half inch tubing and a fiberglass mosquito style nose cone, 38 millimeter motor mount, quarter inch birch ply fins, and centering rings and nose weight meant 18 to 20 pounds ready to fly using a J570 or bigger. It needed a seven foot chute at that weight and seven pounds of nose weight and about 1500 foot altitude for that flight profile. Here's the lightweight version. This, this is actually a scale, so this is a seven inch diameter, but very close to what you do with high power material. That's one advantage in doing these yourself. You can pick whatever diameter you want to because you're making it, you're building it up. Uh, 29 millimeter stuffer tube, the PML parachute bay, 154 inch chute, 13 ounces of nose weight is all and that nose weight is up here under this transition piece so the only thing that ejects on the model is this little silver cap 
and that's connected to a plywood plate and a coupler. That's the only thing that ejects in this model. And five pounds ready to fly with an I-205 to around 1,250 feet. So let's look at a Titan II. So Titan II, I built mine with seven and a half inch lock tubing. Um, I used nested traffic cones for the nose cone because the Titan nose cone has an ablative structure that is thicker on the front half. So I used one for the main cone, I slipped another one over the top, and then I used a chain link finch post metal cap uh, that plugged into the top of the cone when I cut it at the right point, and that made the perfect shape. It was sturdy, and, um, and it looked the part. 38 millimeter motor mount, because I like long, skinnier motors, I was using like J570s or the 510s um, in the 1360 casing. I used 3 16th inch polycarbonate fins because this was, again, a 20 pound model, so it needed thicker, uh, thicker fins. And it required a uh, seven foot chute, again, 20 pounds, four pounds of nose weight, and again, around the same five, 1,500 foot altitude. Here's a picture showing the two. So the one on the left is the high power version. You can see the black nested cone on the top. I've got a couple of screws in there which secured the two nested cones because glue doesn't adhere to that, um, that material very well, and that allowed me to remove it and do some maintenance if I needed to. Uh, this is fully wrapped vinyl from Sticker Shock, so there's no paint on this model except for the little bit of black up on the cap. And you can see my dummy nozzles here, which are made with um, um, cocktail stainless steel jiggers for measuring drinks. They had grooves in them, and it worked really well, and they're, they're sturdy. The one over here on the right has the same nozzles, but it has a little bit less display nozzle. So I was trying to minimize, no, minimize nose weight. So this one's actually slightly bigger because it's an 8-inch diameter model. And um, again, same, same wrap around it. You can see a little bit of wrinkle down at the bottom here um, where the uh, fin flex had pushed in on the skin just a little bit. And um, I heated that up with a hair dryer and uh, pushed the vinyl back down, and it looks fine. And, these are using 332nd inch fins. 8 inch diameter airframe, again, same stuff or two, very similar construction because it worked. I had to add no nose weight at all. This particular nose is a hardwood um, cap for the end of a banister, but it was the right diameter. It was lighter than the metal one, and um, um, that gave me the, the CG that I wanted without anything extra. Five and a half pounds, 1,200 foot altitude. Here's a Pershing, Pershing 1A. Now this one, I couldn't get a scale nose cone. I was too lazy to try and build one. So I took a, a long conical fiberglass cone that I could find with the idea that I'd rather have a quite a not, not quite scale Pershing than not have any Pershing at all. Uh, again, 72 inches long, seven and a half inch diameter. I used eighth inch fiberglass for the fins. Uh, because I wasn't worried about the weight so much. They're fairly small. Um, and this one, again, came out to be about 25 or 20 pounds with a J570 and required the same 7-foot shoot, 7 pounds of nose weight, and 1,500-foot altitude typically. The, the CG on this is running probably about where the uh, letter M is in Army or maybe the R, so it's fairly far, far forward. And, in this model since these are fairly scale size fins. Here's the lightweight version. These fins are a little bit oversized. This is actually an upscale of the Estes Maxi Brute version, which had slightly larger fins. I don't think it looks too bad. But in this particular one, the whole airframe structure up until that top horizontal band, there's the black tip here and that horizontal black band, that's where it separates. So that's the nose cone, just this tiny part up here, the parachute bay is inside down to the next band and then the rest of it is just again normal internal structure on top of it and the altimeter is mounted in the white section in the middle here because that was an easy way that I could access it and had enough room um, and and I could put a door there so the squib has to go fairly far up into the um, into the parachute bay on that one 
uh, eight inch diameter, same stuffer tube, same chute. Get this, Pershing 1A, eight inch diameter, six feet tall, no nose weight required at all. Five and a half pounds ready to fly, same 1250 foot altitude. Here's some pictures. Here is the centering rings. You can see the uh, slots for the uh, for the stringers. In the stringers, I haven't cut the matching slots for them to lock into. Here's the stuffer tube. So here's your motor tube with a joint. It goes up into the parachute bay. Next to it is the little uh, <clears throat> altimeter pod sitting next to it. And the coupler in the front, that's what's going to glue to the nose section. It's going to slide into that parachute bay. Here's some assembly. So this is a Titan II. So you can see I've assembled all of the stringers and centering rings for the majority of the airframe. In the middle, you can see that fence, the, um, the banister post block. And you can see how I've made uh, adapter stringers to go on the outside of the parachute bay and above it to basically build the nose cone. And the only part that ejects on here is just this upper part with the hardwood block and that first set of angled stringers that go down to a plywood plate and the coupler. I have put a little extra ring around the outside of the uh, PML tube of extra PML tubing just to give a little bit of a lip to reinforce for, um, uh, for uh, zipper effect. And over on the right, then, you can see the whole stack put together. Um, this doesn't have the complete stuffer tube up the middle yet. It's just dry fit. So here's the recovery attachment. So I have two centering rings with an eye bolt that goes through both of them, too. This is the top centering ring, which will have the rail button where this line is. And the PML tubing is going to slide over, glue to these two centering rings and that upper plate. So again, all of the recovery load uh, is, is all attached to this and then the stuffer tube. Here's a picture to show the slot. So I've glued hardwood blocks in between these two plates. Uh, you can see the upper one I've drilled lightning holes on the upper centering ring because it doesn't need that much strength. It's just something hard that you can mount these blocks to. So these are just uh, spruce quarter inch sticks glued next to each other with the right spacing. And the uh, fin, which is polycarbonate, it's got holes drilled for lightning, and that just slides right into the slots, and those slots take all the wear. You can also see the block down here. That's my mounting point for the rail button. I made it over long, so I had a little bit of margin for, um, you know, I, I didn't have to be so critical where I was exactly mounting it. Here's the alternate fin mounting. This is the mid-mounted fin on a Pershing 1A, so you can see these little pie-shaped plywood plates that I've stuck in between the two stringers and but and um, you know and, and uh, uh, glued to the foam centering rings with the same kind of slot. So again, these are the things that take the brunt of the landing load, but they don't need to be a full um, a full uh, centering ring. So that saves some weight. Here's a little picture with the door open. So these show two stringers, and in that area, I'm able to slide in this 38 millimeter. Uh, pod with a little JST wire. It's got a Velcro at the bottom and a Velcro strap that keeps the uh, altimeter in place. You plug it in to uh, connect it to the squib, and there's a little magnet here that holds the door closed. And we'll show a couple of uh, videos here. Here's the Pershing. So you can see dead straight, no issues with stability, nose weight, no nose weight was needed with this. One thing you'll notice with these, with the large amount of base area and the light weight, here's the Hellfire. They tend to go up and kind of hang vertically and then either slide backwards or just pop the nose cone. This one arcs over a little bit more. You can see how slow and you can see the entire ejection sequence. You'll see it more on the, uh, the 10 inch Atlas here. You'll see it just sort of hang there. And then the parachute pops out, and then it pulls out of the parachute bag. So you can see how light and how little the ejection part. Here's the Titan II. Nice straight boost. I think this one has another one with good hang time. They just kind of 
hang there. In this particular case, it actually throws the parachute up into the air because the model's almost stopped and uh, no issues with ejecting. And at the end here, if you have access to the presentation, there will be links to where you can get the DEPRON. I have several threads on the Rocketry forum that show more pictures and how I built these things, and also my RC Groups uh, page, which has a lot of things that I post here. So I'm going to kill that and stop sharing and go back. And hopefully that all worked. I'm going to go into the Q&A. Okay, so I'm going to go down to the bottom. Okay, uh, if I have no motor ejection, why the full-length stuffer tube? So I was concerned about landing and um, recovery system loads, and I wanted basically a spine. So a 29 millimeter stuffer tube doesn't add a significant amount of weight for that full length. So that was a, a easy way for me to get some. Um, uh, basically just kind of a spine that all this foam was attached to. Uh, does the part polycarbonate remain flat when used as fin stock? Yes. Uh, in the 16th, and um, uh, you, I mean, you saw how straight the, uh, the Atlas flew. That's 1 16th inch triangular fins, and it uh, flies just fine. Uh, they, don't, they don't warp. Uh, Joe Pfeiffer, what do you use in an adhesive for the polycarbonate? Um, so again, the slots are taking most of the load, and so I just used a um, light amount of a flexible epoxy in this particular case just to keep them from falling out of the slot, but they don't really need much more than that. They're not going to pull out of the airframe. Um, again, fiberglass cloth is an option. Um, I just don't particularly like the mess and fuss of fiberglassing over it. I wanted something quick to construct, and these models have lasted dozens of flights um, with no issues. So I, I, I don't personally see an advantage for the where I'm flying to need that. Um, Again, polycarbonate with lightning holes in it in small sizes don't add that much weight. And in the Pershing, I just put uh, a layer of um, the um, same Oracal on both sides of the fin. Those I haven't painted the polycarbonate. That's actually just vinyl on both sides to give it the color. How do I cut the foam disc? So typically, I'll use one of my plywood centering rings that I've made for the top and the bottom as my template, and I just cut these out by hand with an X-Acto knife. I may make a second one out of cardboard or foam for cutting the slots, but it really, you know, it took maybe 45 minutes to cut a set of stringers and centering rings for a model like this. It really doesn't take all that long once you figure out how you're going to put it together. Um, how do I measure fin placement for large diameters? Um, are you talking about how do I find them once I've I'm, – I'm not sure what that – maybe you can clarify your question, what you meant there. <laughs> question from Reggie about my cooking of projects I put on Facebook. Um, would I consider a V2? So the V2 has large fins that hang down below the airframe and it's got two boat tails and a boat tail between the the skins so that would be a more complex fin structure reinforcing skinning project so i wouldn't personally choose to do this on something like that because i'm inherently lazy and that's not my bag but you know Obviously, the guys in Australia did the same kind of thing, right? They did a, used a foam structure. The guys that uh, did the uh, three-quarters scale um, um, mercury redstone, again, did stringers and plywood uh, uh, centering rings and a fiberglass shell in a very large scale, same kind of idea. Um, kidding it? Probably not, because that's a lot of cutting for me 
Um, there are a lot of customizations that users would probably want to do. The skin is a large piece. I couldn't get that to fit into a box. It really, it, it's really not practical, but it's fairly straightforward to do it yourself. Yeah, like you said, the V2 compound curves would be more of a problem with that. And I think I'm against the hour, so thanks very much. Hope you enjoyed that. Take care.